All right, we're in uh, 2 Kings chapter 11. <clears throat> we ended with the talking about Queen Athaliah taking, usurping the throne. Wicked woman. Yeah, she killed all her grandbabies. She was quite a woman. Good grandma. She wanted to make sure that she stayed on the throne. Nobody's going to kick her off. Um, Queen Athaliah in Judah, that'll be in the south country there. Um, Jehoiada makes a covenant between the Lord and the people. Um, in 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 17, Jehoiada is the 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 priest at this time and he's the one who's been protecting uh, Josiah uh, keeping him out of the view of Queen Athaliah so she doesn't kill him 2nd Kings eleven seventeen, and Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people that they should be the Lord's people between the king also and the people okay so he's made a covenant between himself and the the king that's to be this seven-year-old boy, and then the people that are around. You can see it. It says it another, almost the same, but it adds a little more in Second Chronicles chapter twenty-three, sixteen. Second Chronicles twenty-three, sixteen. It says in Jehoiada made a covenant between him, so he himself he's including himself in this covenant, and that's a good thing to see and between all the people, and between the king, that they should be the Lord's people. That's good. So all of them have decided they're going to submit themselves to God's rules and regulations and be his people. Now you'll see all the way through this thing, and as, as we get toward the end of his life, the priest here is the backbone of the south. That's the reason they're doing well. And when he dies, everything just falls apart. Because he's the one, and you see it right here, he's trying to get the people to make a covenant, commit themselves to God, and make sure the king is on board with what God wants, and it's a great thing when it's going in the right direction. But as soon as he's taken out of the picture, everything falls apart. People follow people. It's unfortunate, but that's the fact. There's no way around it. I would love to say, you don't need to follow anybody, just get a Bible and follow Jesus. But it doesn't work that way. Men follow men. You'll look to someone. So you need a good example. And he was a good example for the people. Uh, the people destroy the house of Baal. That's a great thing. Through the, the influence of Jehoiada the priest there, they're getting rid of anything wicked. That'll be in 2 Kings eleven eighteen. 2 Kings eleven eighteen, And all the people of the land went into the house of Baal and break it down. His altars and his images break they in pieces thoroughly and slew um, Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altar. And the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. <clears throat> okay, they're getting rid of wickedness. Notice some of the things they get rid of. They break down the altars and get rid of the images. Both of those are wicked things. From the beginning of your Bible, God says, when you come in and you destroy these other nations, destroy their images i don't want you to see what they were seeing and worshiping so we've got a, a tv now in america that you can't watch what we've just been talking about because it's images one after the next that's just wicked and so you got to destroy it not the tv the images um and you find the same thing in second chronicles 23 17 i'm not going to read it to you but that's the cross reference all right, that's what's going on in the south. Meanwhile, in the north, we have Jehu. Jehu, he's a, he's a tough man. Jehu's ruling Israel. What he does is he does not remove Jeroboam's two golden calves or depart from Jeroboam's sins. Now, while he's been on a mission from God to eliminate Haziel and the house of Ahab, he is not gone wholeheartedly after God. Now, he's done the things God wanted him to do, but he didn't decide to follow God in the doing. And we can get caught up in that mess, too. 
if we know something right to do and we're just doing it because we view that as the mission instead of God as the mission, then that's who we are. We're Jehu. We're on a mission to do something spiritual. Well, it may have been. But if it's not still under the direction of God the whole time, we'll end up with some of Jeroboam's calves sitting in our living room. Or we'll keep uh, the sins of the fathers. Second Kings 10:29. 2 Kings 10:29. Howbeit from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit, the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. They've got a satellite church there. <laughs> He's got golden calves on either side. He's going to make sure nobody's going to make that journey to Jerusalem. If they make that journey to Jerusalem, they're going to see something real. So we've got to keep them entertained with entertainment. We've got to give them what they've always desired, the worship of Egypt. And we'll give them exactly what they want. And we'll give them twice as much as what the Lord does. The Lord has one place, Jerusalem. And there's not all this, you know, worldly Egyptian worship influence in it. Well, that's what the people craved. So he says, I, if I give them this, they'll stay true to me. I don't have to worry about them running off. Whatever I tell them, they'll do. And that's what they do. The Lord does something good for him. He promises to continue his dynasty for four generations. Why? I don't. Because he decided to do it. <laughs> you would think with the wickedness that we just saw causing Israel, all of Israel to sin by going after golden calves, that God would have cut him off. God says, no, I'm going to let you have four generations. So God must have thought him completing the mission of destroying Ahab's house was really worth something. So let's see it in 2 Kings 10.23. 2 Kings 10.23. In those days, the Lord began to cut Israel short. Uh, that doesn't mean they they weren't as tall as they used to be. <laughs> That's Second Kings ten, verse thirty-two to thirty-three. That too. <laughs> verse thirty-two to thirty-three. In those days, the Lord began to cut Israel short. Okay, so now He's mad at Israel. They've been going up to worship golden calves. When they go up to worship golden calves, God does what he does when you worship a false god. He destroys it and you at the same time. He's beginning to cut Israel short. He's chastening them. And Haziel smote them in all the coast of Israel. From Jordan eastward. Okay, wait a minute. Jordan eastward. Where's that? That's Ephraim. Yeah, that's, that's Manasseh, the half-tribe of Manasseh. Yeah, Gad and and who else is there? Uh, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. That's their territories. Well, they're easy pickings. They're on the wrong side. So here it is. Haziel begins to smote the coast of Israel from Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead and, and the Gadites and the Reubenites and the Manassites, from Aror, which is by the river Arnon, even to Gilead in Bashan. And those are all things you can look up on the map. They're all listed. You can find them up there. Um, so that's, uh, that's what's going on up north. Bad news. Let's see what happens down south now. We have to keep changing our, uh, our viewfinder <laughs> to see what's going on. Down in Queen Athaliah's territory in Judah, Jehoiada appoints officers of the house of the Lord. That's good. He is just working double time. He's doing, he sees all the wickedness that's going on. He's seen Athaliah's reign of terror. And it's just wicked, wicked, wicked everywhere. So he's doing double duty to push things as far as he can toward the Lord. 2 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 18. 2 Chronicles 23, verse 18. Also Jehoiada appointed officers of the house of the Lord by the hand of the priest, the Levites, whom David uh, had distributed to the house of the Lord to offer burnt offerings of the Lord, as is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing and singing, 
as it was ordained by David. Okay, you see what's going on here? He said we're going back and we're going to find out how it was done in the old days. We're going to Moses and we're going to David when things were right. And we're going to duplicate what they were doing. You'll get this train back on the rail. Verse 19. And he uh, set the porters at the gates of the house of the Lord, that none which was unclean in anything should enter in. He says, okay, this is going to be a holy spot right here. We're going to try to make the whole uh, Judah kingdom do right. And we probably won't be able to do it, but we're going to do all we can to do it. And we're going to have one sanctuary spot. Nothing unclean's coming in here. We want them all to get clean, but we're going to pur pur purify one spot that's safe, like a city of refuge. Uh, Joash is placed on the throne. He's been hid from his mom in 2 Kings 11, verse 19. His grandmother. Queen Athaliah. Second Kings 11, verse 19. And he took the rulers over hundreds and the captains, the guards, and all the people of the land. And they brought down the king from the house of the Lord. That's a good place to find a king, in the house of the Lord. And, uh, and came by the way of the gate of the guard to the king's house. And he sat down on the throne of the kings. And all the people of the land rejoiced. And the city was in quiet. And they slew Athaliah with a sword beside the king's house. Okay, so they're getting rid of Athaliah. Her time is up. And they're going to put this young child on the throne as king. He's been under the tutelage of the priest. So he's been brought up with some good training. He's ready to go, and he won't go 100% on his own. He'll still be counseled by the priest, and you'll see the farther we go what happens with that. I'm going to just give you a few things that happen out of the parallel account that's in Second Chronicles 23.20. Uh, that, that'll be verse 20 to 21. In verse 21, he words it a little bit different. He says, And the city was quiet after that they had slain Athaliah with the sword. That's what happens. You throw the scorner out and you've got peace. And that's what they did. When they killed Athaliah, there was a noticeable change. The city had peace. That's a good thing. It's a spiritual thing. Now, you've still got the the problem of you got to watch out for enemies coming in and all that stuff that's still there but if you can not have the spiritual turmoil turmoil that goes on you'll feel at peace you can have peace with god and have turmoil with the world and the peace with god is superior to the world's turmoil however if you've got turmoil spiritually whether you've got it physically or not you feel like you do and you probably will. Okay, so that's Queen Athaliah getting her due. In the north, in the kingdom of Israel, Jehu's territory, Haziel, king of Syria, begins to, to go after Israel. He smites Israel. In 2 Kings 10, 32 and 33, I already read that to you, didn't I? Yep. Okay, that, that's him going after Israel. Then we get... Uh, 2 Kings 10 verse 34 this is the end of his rule 2 Kings 10 34 now the rest of the acts of Jehu and all he did and all his might are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel and Jehu slept with his fathers and they buried him in Samaria and Jehoahaz his son reigned in his stead Okay, so he gets a son to reign in his stead. That's a good thing. It's been promised that he's going to have four generations. So that's good as far as uh, the prestige goes. He got to reign a total of 28 years. Um, in verse 36 there it says, And the time that Jehu reigned over Israel and Samaria was 20 and 8 years. That's, that's 6, but it's 8. 20 and 8 years. Okay, so now we've got new blood. In the south down where they've replaced the wicked woman, Athaliah, we've got a new king on the throne. This is Joash. That'll be in uh, 2 Kings 11, 21. He reigns approximately 835 to 796 B.C. That's 40 years in Judah. Joash begins to reign in the seventh year of Jehu, 2 Kings eleven twenty one. 21. 
Seven years old was uh, Joash when he began to reign. A seven-year-old on the throne. <laughs> wow. But if we had, you know, I'd love to see a seven-year-old with that much wisdom. <laughs> Been trained for seven years by the priest who's dedicated to the things of the Lord and has told this seven-year-old he's going to make a covenant between him and God and they're going to make sure this thing runs right. Yeah, that'd be a good deal. Yeah, much like King James. In Second Kings 12, verse 1, And in the seventh year of jo uh, Jehu, Joash began to reign. Forty years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Ze Zebeliah of Beersheba. And you see the same thing again in Second Chronicles 24, 1. Joash is seven years old when he begins to reign. Forty years he reigns. Uh, okay, he does right in the sight of the Lord. That's a good thing. But there's one little clause in here. All the days of Jehoiada, the priest. After his teacher is gone, he just goes crazy. Second Kings 12, verse 2. Second Kings 12, 2. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. But the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense in the high places. Bad news. Same thing happens in Second Chronicles 24, verse 2. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. So as long as he's got the schoolmaster there to make sure he's doing what he's supposed to do and holding him accountable to the covenant he's made, he does right. But when that guy's gone, he's still not learned to ride the bike without training wheels. <laughs> um, meanwhile, up north in Israel, we have um, Jehoahaz. He's going to reign for 17 years. Remember, he's Jehu's son. Uh, 2 Kings 13, verse 1. And the three and twentieth year of Joash, the son of ah ah Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel in Samaria and reigned seventeen years. So he gets seventeen years. That's a short reign compared to what's going to happen in the south. Joash gets forty years. And wickedness shortens a man's life. <laughs> he says to... Honor your parents that you get long life. Well, doing just the opposite gives you just the opposite. Short life. <laughs> he lives wicked. You get what wickedness earns, death. Uh, in Second Kings 13, verse 2, he does what we would expect him to do, evil. Second Kings 13, 2. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. Now, that's interesting to note. We'll see him try to veer off a little bit, but he's, he's not fooling God with it. A lot of times people do that. They'll live a wicked life, and then, you know, it really starts to bear on them. And then they run to God to get a quick fix. Fix this situation. They're not running to God for for God being God, and them wanting to be in submission to him. They're running to God so he can come help them. Um, and that's what he'll do. He said there, he departed not therefrom. Even though he runs to God later on, God doesn't consider it him having turned to him. Okay, the next thing we see is in the south, Joash. Joash, he takes uh, two wives. Why in the world? He takes two wives. He's, uh, he's beginning to show his idiocy, if that's even a word. He's not. He's not. I'm sure Jehoiada was not advising him on that. That's Second Chronicles 24, verse 3. It says, And Jehoiada took for him two wives, and he begat sons and daughters. So they do that. That's Second Chronicles 24, 3. That's uh, and Jehoiada took for him two wives. Yes, back up. Um, 
I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, I do. Second Chronicles 24, look at verse 1. Second Chronicles. Okay. Second Chronicles 24. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Z uh, Zabaya, Zibia. Z yeah. My pronunciation says the first I is long, the second I is short, and the A is short. Zabia, Bia, Zabia, of Beersheba. And Joash did, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest, and Jehoiada took for him two wives. Okay, so he told Jehoiada, go get me these women. Well, he's king now. He can do whatever he decides he's going to do. Now, Jehoiada is doing it not because he's approving it. He's doing it because he's in submission to his king. And you're going to find out there's bad blood that's... Well, I don't want to get ahead of the story, but... <laughs> so this is where we find his next his next public transgression is he gets two wives. This always when they multiply wives, watch it. Watch every time it happens in the Bible when a person multiplies wives, they multiply problems. They start getting uh, I mean big things falling apart. And this is no exception. Uh he repairs the temple, that's a good thing. That'll be in 2 Kings 12, verse 4. Second Kings 12, verse 4. Now, I'm sure Jehoiada is behind all this. This is his home, is the temple. You know, he wants that repaired. He wants people doing the right thing. That's what he's responsible for. He repairs the temple, and you can read uh, that whole passage. I'm not, it's long. I'm not going to read it to you. It's 2 Kings 12, 4 to 16. And he tells you in there all the things they do, and he goes through it one thing after the next, and they collect money for it. Uh, pick it up in verse 15. Moreover, they reckon not with the men into whose hands they delivered the money to be bestowed on the workmen, for they dealt faithfully. Uh, the trespass money and the sin money was not brought into the house of the Lord. It was the priest. So he says there what they did was they did what they're supposed to. They paid somebody to do it right. That's a good thing. <laughs> they, they weren't scrimping and cutting corners trying to just slap something together. They were finding somebody who could do this, somebody who could do that. They needed some gold and silver bowls made. They found somebody who could repair the ones they had. You, you find the whole story in there, and they're not, they're not afraid to spend money on it. And at the same time, he says, we're not going to take the trespass offering money to do it with. Uh, the people will bring, will bring the money or we're not going to do it. And that's the way they do it. I like the way that, um, that Olive Baptist does their church. They don't borrow money. When they need something, they save for it. They get everybody involved in it. And if, if the congregation wants to do it, the congregation will support it. And it gets done. And, So in the north, in Israel, we have Jehoahaz, Jehu's son, and Hazael, king of Syria, and Ben-Hadad, his son, uh, oppress Israel. Israel is just going to start getting beat up left and right, the northern territory, because they've transgressed against God and they've made him mad. So rather than God just destroy them all at once, you know, that would be the easy way to go out. There's... <laughs> There's a lot worse things than death. There's suffering and wishing you were dead. <laughs> Second Kings 13, 3. Second Kings 13, verse 3. He says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, 
all their days. He's stretching it out. He's punishing them. Now, that's mercy. It sure doesn't feel like it, and it sure doesn't look like it, but if you think a little bit, it is mercy. He didn't destroy them all at once. He's putting a little bit of pressure. He knows just how much pressure to put to get their attention, and when they refuse to turn, he puts a little more pressure and a little more and a little more. People aren't getting away with evil, but when we look at their life, we sometimes think they get away with evil. They're not getting away with it. God's putting pressure in ways we probably don't see. And they know it. And the more they refuse it, the more pressure he puts until eventually we can see it. We can see their life fall apart. But before it fell apart where it was visual to us, it was falling apart where it was obvious to them in their conscience. Second Kings 13 verse 7. Second Kings 13 7. Neither did he leave of the people to Jehoahaz but fifty horsemen and ten chariots and ten thousand footmen for the king of Syria had destroyed them and he made them like the dust of the threshing of dust by threshing. He said just the way you would thresh wheat and all that's left is the dust and uh, the, the stuff you don't want the chaff. He said that's what we're going to do to Israel and that's what he did. But you saw the people he's taken out first, the ones who decided to stay on the wrong side of the river. But eventually it's going to move on across the river, and that's the way it happens unless you turn in uh, verse 22. But Haziel, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. It's just going to keep on and keep on, and they're not going to turn. You can count on it. The kingdoms in the north are wicked. And they'll remain that way, and that's why they end soon. The kingdom in the south will last longer. We'll, we'll get there when we get there. Uh, Jeho- Jehoahaz seeks the Lord, and Israel's delivered from the Syrians. Here he's going to make a good move. However, he's doing it for the wrong reason. He's not turning to the Lord because he's God. He's turning to the Lord because he's a good fighter. They want the benefit from God without the God. Now, God honored it just because he's gracious, just because he's merciful, and he likes to help. 2 Kings 13, verse 4. 2 Kings 13, 4. And Jehoahaz besought the Lord, and the Lord hearkened unto him. For he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Syria oppressed them. And the Lord gave Israel a savior. So that they went out from under the hand of the Syrians, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. Okay, so there he gives them a Savior. Now, the Savior, he doesn't tell you right out there what he's talking about. He just says Savior. And you understand that as to be someone to save them from their enemy, and that's exactly what he's talking about. And it's probable that the Savior he's talking about is... Jehoahaz's his son. And you know what his name is? Joash. Because we needed another one of those. <laughs> so, that begins to tell you what's going to happen next. I like that name. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. It, it, yeah. So, the next time we get into kings we're going to see two with the same name again (laughs) just because that's so much fun god wants to make sure you're paying attention when you're reading otherwise you just you just be bored and you blah blah blah, one word after the next but when you see that both the kings are named the same thing you've got to really pay attention to figure out which one he's talking about and you'll pull your hair out sometimes and you'll get a scrap of paper and try to start diagramming it and all that Correct. At the same time. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Fun stuff. Yeah. Now, let's see. Um, I think we can go one more slide, and that'll be it. In the south, Joash. Joash in Judah. Jehoiada dies, and Judah becomes idolatrous. Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, uh, rebukes the people. For their turn to iniquity, and they do what wicked people do, they stone him. This is in the south. This is supposed to be the godly side, Judah. They 
they're bad news. Second Chronicles 24, verse 15. That's second, yeah, 24, verse 15 to 22. And I probably should have, that's a lot of verses to read. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> verse 15. But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died. And 130 years old was when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward, the house, uh, toward his house. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king, and the king hearkened unto them. Uh, and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for their uh, trespass. Well, what do you expect is going to happen? They've seen it over and over. They've got a up to the minute live broadcast going on in the north they can watch it anytime they want to see it but yet no they want to be in the movie themselves <laughs> yeah they just crave it. It, it you can see it's a craving they have for it and the second there's no pressure on them they revert back to it wholeheartedly 19 yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. He said, no, sir, we don't want to hear that mess. We've heard it before. Verse 20. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people, and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandment of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Okay, he's saying, you know what happens when you do this? Death comes. The wages of sin is death. There's no way around that. Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him, and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Bad news. The king says, kill the son of my teacher. Because he's teaching the same thing his dad did, and now we've decided we want newfangled worship. Oof. Verse 26. Uh, 22. Thus Joash the king uh, remembered not the kindness of Jehoiada his father, uh, which, his, which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it and requite it. Bad news. Well, you know he's going to have to pay for that. So the, the righteousness that we've seen build up in. in uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, is gone now for the time being. Meanwhile, up north in Israel, uh, Israel continues to sin. Well, we expect that. Uh, that's, that's all they've done all along. I don't think they know how to do anything else. <laughs> in Second Kings thirteen six, Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel to sin, but walked therein. And there remain the groves also in Samaria. These groves are just pure wickedness. Now, that's a, a grove is not just a stand of trees. This had a specific purpose. It was a garden for gods. It was a place. But now, they're not just worshiping the gods. They're actually worshiping the grove. The actual trees and everything in the grove. They're worshiping it. And it's amazing to see anything you can do that man takes pleasure in, you'll see they end up having to take their bow to it. They are on their knees worshiping it. A gardener is on his knees worshiping his plants. You know, if, if your goal in life is to have the most beautiful car, then you'll be out there washing it all the time and you'll be on your knees worshiping it. If you just back up and look at what you take in life, if you're not careful, you'll find yourself doing exactly what they did with their gods. They had them a grove, and they'd bow down to it, and they'd be worshiping it. Grove's got to go. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Je Jehoahaz, in uh, 2 Kings 13, verse 8, we find the closing remarks on his life. Second Kings thirteen eight and nine. 
Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jehoahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. In Samaria. And who? Joash's son reigned in his sed. Okay, so next week we'll start off with two confusing kings at once, and we'll see if we can sort it all out.